Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Kristen Cole. She's an assistant professor of communication studies. Her Kevin MD article is titled, Yoga and Self-Care Won't Cure My Crohn's Disease. Kristen, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah. So I, like you mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of communication studies at San Jose State University, and I received my PhD from the University of New Mexico in communication studies in 2013. And my area of emphasis originally was mass communication. But then a year after I graduated in 2014, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And that actually really, you know, changed my perspective on life in a lot of ways. Yeah. And one of the ways that it changed my life was that I, I decided to start researching health communication. And I, I feel like it's it sort of, everything came full circle. You know, there are a lot of difficulties when, di when, you, when you're diagnosed with a chronic illness, but one of the positives in my life was that I'm now able to sort of bridge an academic perspective of health communication with a patient perspective of health communication. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. So a lot of times we physicians sometimes don't know what it's like when our patients get diagnosed with a disease like Crohn's disease. So give us a story and give us some perspective. You said that your life changed after this diagnosis. How so? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I talk a little bit about this in my article, but you know, I had never really been sick in my life. And I think for most of my life, I just assumed that healthcare in a certain way. And then when you're diagnosed with a chronic illness, you're, you find yourself like deep, you know, into this matrix of healthcare that is so complicated to navigate as a patient. And it, you know, there are a lot of, uh, aspects of having a chronic illness, the day-to-day the -day of, of pain management and, you know, medication management and things that are really complicated. But one of the things that I, I, I like to think of as, you know, very, not, not, I don't know if I want to say positive, but very eye-opening mm -hmm. was really getting this glimpse of this system, uh, you know, from both the patient perspective and an academic perspective and, and looking at the the veil had been removed from my eyes. I, I saw, you know, medicine as this very, you know, perfectly functioning thing that just cures people of disease. And when you have a chronic illness, a cure is not a possibility. And so you see a lot more complicated layers of healthcare. And I thought, oh, wow, I feel like there's something that I can say about this. And I think that that for me was very empowering. And you talk a little bit more about your journey in your Kevin MD article, Yoga and Self-Care Won't Cure My Crohn's Disease. It inspired you to take more of an interest in health communication. So tell us, what surprised you when you delved into this world? I think one of the things um, that surprised me the most when I started getting into health communication um, was... I think how focused health communication is on educating doctors to be better communicators, mm. which is definitely a positive, but there's not a lot about patient advocacy and there's not a lot from the patient perspective. And I think that that's a gap, right? Like there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be said about how patients experience healthcare, how they communicate with their doctors, how they prefer to be communicated to from their doctors, and the, the complexities of things that doctors don't get to see in, on an everyday basis, like how they're navigating health insurance or making appointments or, you know, there's behind the scenes of being a doctor. There's also the behind the scenes of being a patient that I think mm. physicians don't often get a glimpse into. And I think that we need more patient-centered research in health communication. So tell us the story behind this article. Yeah, so this article is actually inspired by one of the first academic articles I wrote under the banner of health communication. Mm -hmm. And it, the title of that article is The Paradox of Patient Consent. It's published in Health Communication. And it's an exploration of my own journey as a patient with regards to like autonomy and choice. And, you know, one of the things I noticed in health communication is when when health communication researchers are talking about how providers should communicate with their patients, they're yeah. really, there's this push towards patient-centered care, sure. which is about involving patients in the decision-making process and giving them the tools necessary for self-management of care. There's a lot of positive things with patient-centered care, but 
one of the things that doesn't get talked about, I think, enough is that the patient-centered model really assumes that everyone wants to and can uniformly have control over mm -hmm. their health. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know, you know, from research that patients from historically marginalized groups don't have equitable access to health information or the same resources as, you know, some patients to make informed decisions about their health care and to manage their own care. We know that women and minorities are consistently underrepresented in the research that determines the medical research that determines their available choices in healthcare. And there are a lot of patients who actually don't, they're not concerned about who's making the choices, but what choices are available to them. Sure. And so I think those are some of the things that the patient centered model leaves out. And, you know, just a, a brief example from my own experience, you know, when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, my doctor gave me choices from all of these options of medications and I was overwhelmed and I didn't know what to choose. Mm -hmm. I inevitably chose one. And then three months later, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And I, you know, I was like, is this related to the medication? And at the time there was no existing research about how, about the safety profile of the medication for patients with cervixes and particularly those who are at higher risk for cervical cancer from HPV. So they're just, I wasn't able to make a totally informed choice because there was no existing research. Mm -hmm. And many years later, I found out that there is, you know, a correlation between the medication I was on and risk of cervical cancer. But at the time that I was making that choice, that just, that reality didn't exist. And so it really opened my eyes to the fact that when patients are making medical choices, sometimes key information just isn't there. And that's not really the fault of anybody, right? It just doesn't exist. But it, it really demonstrates how our choices in medicine are enabled and constrained about factors outside of our control. Sure. And so the concept of control, you know, is, is complex. <laughs> so when you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease and your medical team confronted you with a, a menu of, of options, of choices, what did you do next? Like, how did you research what was the appropriate medication to take? Did your medical team offer any guidance or did you have to do all the research on your own? What happened next? Yeah, great question. So I, you know, I turned to friends and family, right? I'm like, connect me to people that you know who have been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And uh, I want to find out, you know, what people have done, what's worked for people. Mm -hmm. My doctor did give me some information, of course, but it was very, you know, it's very medicalized information. It's, it's sure. bargain heavy. It's very, here's the research and the research is presented as it's, it's very black and white, even though now I know it's more complex than that. So when I turned to friends and family, you know, some people were able to connect me to folks who had Crohn's disease, but in general, people were like, oh, don't take that medication. There's going to be so many side effects. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you got to focus on uh, changing your diet and finding these holistic approaches. Like there has to be a better way than these really intense medications that your doctor is throwing at you. So, and, and of course that's what then threw me into the spiral of control that I talk about in the article. So in an ideal situation, what would you have liked to have seen from your medical team? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things reflecting now for me was, was that I would have really liked for the doctor not to moralize the treatment options, right? I think that was the biggest thing for me. It was because what was when an I asked, what, would be, what would be an example of that? What, yeah, would that look, so what would that look like? Not to say that this is the the right way mm -hmm. and the only way, right? Like your only options are these medic even if that's true, <laughs> okay. even if that is true, it needs to be framed in a less moralistic way that this is the best way, this is the right way, this is the only way that medical research is the end all be all in terms of knowledge. And and again, even if that is true in the mind of the doctor and 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 even if now I know that that is indeed one of the best ways for me, I mm -hmm. think the the sort of framing of it as the best, the right, nothing else is going to work for you, in my mind was very dismissive. And I think in my particular situation, it was packaged when I asked the doctor about like, well, what else can I do besides these really intense medications? He said, well, I know your generation's really into holistic approaches, but this isn't something that can be cured by magic pills and diets. And so yeah. it was like, that was very dismissive, right? And sure. I think for me, 
the dismissiveness through this moralization of this is the best way put me on the defense and yeah, yeah. i immediately was like no no there has to be you know this person is dismissing me there has to be a better way and then so i spiraled into control i tried to control everything thing through diet and exercise and then that's what inevitably led to the complications later down the road so i think if the if the doctor from the start I de- i've actually had a very empowering encounter with a doctor who said to me you know, medical research is imperfect, Mm -hmm. but it's the best tool that we have. And so all we can do is work from this imperfect reality until more information is available. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was this really like transparent conversation about the benefits and limitations of the treatment options that was like, okay, I can feel my brain sort of relaxing and releasing that control because I know that actually control isn't entirely possible, but I'm just going to work from what we have at the moment, right? What about getting a second opinion, perhaps, with a a medical team that would treat you more like a partner? Yes, yeah. I mean, I I saw so many doctors. I I did get a lot of opinions, and I think it actually took, I think, to the third or fourth opinion when I finally found a doctor who was willing to (laughs) you know, have that realistic conversation with me. I had a doctor at one point who basically, Mm -hmm. I say, I said, put the fear of surgery in me. He was Mm -hmm. like, either take the medications, you're getting surgery. And that Mm -hmm. was also this binary thinking that I was like, no, no, there has to be more. And I think in my, my mind at the time, I was thinking that the more would be other options. But then when I met the doctor who finally said like, yeah, no, medical research isn't perfect and medications have side effects, but it's about weighing your options and the benefits and the, it was like when someone really explained to me in this transparent way that Mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, trying to hide the imperfectness of the medical system, that's when it clicked for me. Like, oh, the thing I'm searching for is not more control. The thing I'm searching for is just more acknowledgement Mm -hmm. of imperfectness in that process of control. (laughs) So What's the situation now? What's your relationship with your medical team? Yeah, so I have a, a great medical team now. And one of the, I think one of the, the things for me that's been really empowering with my team is we, we've all, we're all sort of on the same page now about like what is urgent and what, you know, what needs to be treated. I think when you're not, when you don't have a chronic illness and you get sick, it's like, obviously that needs to be treated. Now with a chronic illness, it's, it's more complicated. Yeah. Like, Things need to be treated, but they. It, we also need to acknowledge that, like, some things are normal. Like, some. I'm not always. I'm never going to be entirely pain free. I'm. You know. I'm. Symptoms are going to crop up that don't necessarily need to be treated because, you know, the the treatment I'm on might correct course correct at some point. So, just a medical team that really understands, you know, what, <laughs> basically, like, what I like, how I'd like to approach treatment. And, and, and they're on board with that because we've kind of met in the middle in terms of, you know, this is what's urgent and this is what's not, and this is what's normal for your body. I think that's the key, right? Like what's normal for one body is not normal for another body. And so really having a deep understanding of, and, and the empowerment to feel the intuition of what's normal for my body and them being on board with that, I think has, that's been really great. We're talking to Kristen Cole. She's an assistant professor of communication studies. Her cabinet of the article is titled, Yoga and Self-Care Won't Cure My Crohn's Disease. So Kristen, what are some of your tips? I I normally like to ask this in two ways. Tips for clinicians who may be listening to this and tips for patients who may have been recently diagnosed with a chronic disease. Yeah. So for physicians, I want to go back to that, you know, being mindful of not moralizing treatment options and just being really transparent about benefits and limitations of all treatment options, yeah. right? Being willing to have those conversations open and honestly. So what I are think, some what's some what's some things that you could say that that would make patients feel better? That that acknowledgement of we don't know. So so what what are some ways that we can phrase that? Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, the, the doctor that I talked to who was basically like, it's imperfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I talked to a doctor one time who was, who told me, who basically explained to me how medical research happens. And that was really eye opening as well. Cause he was like, you know, we don't know something now. And then it's not like we're going to know it overnight. Mm-hmm. It's someone might research it and we'll have findings and that'll take years to trickle down to all physicians. Right. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, just the knowing the slowness of the medical research process yeah. was also, I mean, just any of those 
kinds of conversations about this is how things work. This is where we get our information from. This is how knowledge creation happens in healthcare. And, you know, we don't have all the perfect solutions and options, but we know we have really great tools that are effective and have these benefits and these limitations. So that transparency, I think, is is really important. And not just saying, like, this is the best way, the only way, the right way, but this is the way that we know works right now. <laughs> sure. And then from um, the uh, patient standpoint, what are some tips you yeah, share from, with them? Yeah, from the patient standpoint, I really want people to feel like they have permission to let go of control. I think, you know, when I talk about it in the article, obsessive control through this, this ideology of healthism, right? So this belief that we have to be personally responsible for our health mm -hmm. made me sicker. <laughs> and I've, I've seen that so many times when I share my story with people, they're like, oh my gosh, same, right? They have the same experience. So just giving ourselves permission to let go of control, you know, total control and personal responsibility over our health, like being kind to ourselves, knowing that we can only control so much. There are factors outside of our control and just, you know, to be okay with, with letting some of that go. And my final question, tell us some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Yeah, that I get let go of control. I mean, I, I, I keep coming back to that, but let me phrase it this way. I think it should be, let's, be more honest with each other and ourselves about the limitations of control over health, right? That we're, that we, you know, when we see someone who's not managing their health the way that we would, I think the instinct is to try to say like, no, 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 you're doing it the mm -hmm. wrong way. But to, you know, let people, you know, take control and let go of control in the way that works best for their own health. Prison, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.